Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Shannon Durejo from Crema Media. Welcome to today's webinar, where we will discuss local manufacturing with a focus on rebuilding South Africa's industrial base and exports. Today's webinar is sponsored by Nedbank, Actum, AZ Armaturin, KEW Foundries, Richards Bay Industrial Development Zone, and SER Synergy. We thank them for making this event possible. Before we begin, please be aware that we have enabled the Q&A function, so please post any questions into the Q&A box. You'll find this on the panel at the bottom of your screen. The facilitator will pick out themes in the questions and answer as many of them as possible throughout the discussion. To encourage interaction, we've also enabled the chat function, so you can network with the panelists via the chat box. You'll also find this at the bottom of your screen. Please do not post any questions in the chat box though, as we may miss them. You can post them into the Q&A. Please be aware that we are recording this webinar and we'll be sending the recording to you when it's available. We're also streaming the webinar live to YouTube and we'll share the link in the chat shortly. Today's webinar will be facilitated by Eric Ruchemann, CEO of the South African Capital Equipment Export Council. Eric is passionate about South Africa, its past and its future, its difficulties and its potential. He's a mechanical engineer with a wealth of experience who has worked for the AFDB and the World Bank on the economics of machinery and equipment. Eric will facilitate the discussion with our panel, which consists of Gaylor Montmassen Clare, Senior Economist and SARM Facilitator at Trade and Industrial Policy Strategies, Tafadzwa Chibanguza, Chief Operating Officer at CIFSA, Philippa Rodseth, Executive Director at the Manufacturing Circle. Amit Singh, National Manager for Manufacturing at Nedbank, and Thomas Holtz, Global CEO of Multitech. I'll hand over now to our facilitator, Eric Ruchemann, to take the proceedings forward. Over to you, Eric. Thank you very much, Sharon. Welcome to everybody and welcome to the panelists. Um, just to introduce SACIC, SACIC is the South African uh, uh, Capital Equipment Export Council. We're a public-private partnership with the Department of Trade and Industry and Competition. And our prime function is to facilitate the role in assisting companies to export globally. Uh, the global export for machinery and equipment, capital equipment at the moment is approximately 178 billion rand a year. And SACIC has been proven to be an indispensable part of the globalization of exports. To facilitate, serve, support and develop competitiveness is where we need. We are facing wherever we go, the best against the best. And when you're exporting or manufacturing, you must understand that your competition is the best. A lot of people say they haven't got competition. Believe me, five minutes after you've exported your product, you will have opposition. That's just the way the world goes. Uh, the sectors that we do cover is mining, equipment, agricultural, agribusiness equipment, building and instruction uh, equipment, processing equipment, utilities such as pumps, valves, etc. We're in material handling, environmental control, refining, manufacturing, drilling, digging, and processing. So that's a quick overview of SACIC. I'm now going to ask our panelists um, to introduce themselves and the company and what their company stands for. So we've got one lady today, so I'm going to start with Philippa. Philippa, if you could please introduce yourself and the manufacturing circle. Thank you, Eric. The Manufacturing Circle is a voluntary industry association. Um, we represent the, the voice for, for manufacturing with a view to um, motivating what is required to, to grow and support the manufacturing sector. It's an incredibly important sector in our economy, the um, engine of growth for our economy. Um, but at the same time, um, as we get into the discussion we'll see um, does does experience various challenges. I um, run it and um, we have member companies that represent different uh, subsectors in the the manufacturing sector and also different parts of various value chains. Thanks Eric. 
Thanks, Philippa. Can I ask the Fedra to introduce yourself, please? Thanks, uh, Eric. Uh, yeah, it's Tafadzo Achipanguza. I'm Chief Operating Officer here at CIFSA. CIFSA stands for the Steel and Engineering Industries Federation of Southern Africa. And uh, we are also the uh, voice for the for this sector, which represents 26% uh, of manufacturing, 2.6% of GDP, 900 billion rand in turnover, 40% of that is exported, ex, uh, 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 attracting about 20 billion uh, US dollars in foreign exchange. And um, yeah, we represent the entire value chain from steel production, merchants, fabrication, and also heavy and light engineering. So I look forward to the discussion and uh, the views we can uh, contribute from our end. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. can I ask you from Nedbank to introduce? Yeah, thanks, Eric. Name's Amit Singh, uh, representing Nedbank today. The uh, position that I hold and the custodianship is for the manufacturing sector. I'm the national manager for manufacturing, looking after uh, the, the sector in specific. Key roles and responsibilities that, that fall within my space is ensuring as a bank that we remain relevant, uh, that we are adding value to our market and our clients and ensuring that what we're doing out there is actually making a fundamental difference to both the economy and society. So it's more than just banking. We understand the importance of the manufacturing sector and the role that it plays in the economy. And this is something that's pretty close to our heart. So yeah, that's a short summation of myself. Thanks, Emma. Kailo, can you introduce yourself and tips, please? Yeah, thanks, Eric, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's really a pleasure to, to be here today. Uh, I've got two, two main hats that I, that I want to introduce. Um, I'm a senior economist at, at TIPS, that's Trade and Industrial Policy Strategies. We are uh, an economic policy research institute based in Pretoria, working on supporting policy developments in the country and in the region in support of you know, economic development, social progress, and environmental sustainability. And in that respect, been doing a lot of work on uh, green industrial policy uh, and, and just transition. That's the area that I lead within TIPS. Um, and my second hat um, is the facilitator of, of SARIM, which is the South African Renewable Energy Master Plan. It's a master plan process that's being led by the DMRE and the DTIC jointly to lead the inclusive and industrial development of renewable energy and storage value chains in South Africa. So I look forward to uh, share uh, some knowledge on that as well. Thanks, Leno. Finally, but not least, Thomas from Multitech. Thanks, Eric. Yeah, I'm the CEO of, of Multitech. We're a mining equipment manufacturing business. Um, we do some substantial exporting. We're celebrating our 50th anniversary, proudly South African made products shipped to all over the world and um, growing fairly aggressively at the moment and um, excited to share some of our learnings over the last um, few decades with you today. Thanks, Thomas. And I can just tell everybody that uh, Multitech is a leading exporter and they've won many Accolades, Export for the Year Award, Innovations Award, New Product Innovations Award. And uh, I, I firmly believe that they're leaders in the industry when it comes to this. And we're looking forward to your comments or your discussions later on, Thomas. If I can just paint a picture now, and it's a, a quick picture of where we are in South Africa, and it, and it doesn't really look that um, rosy. Um, if you have a look at our load shedding, um, it's, it's, it's gone a bit crazy and the, they say that the South African economy this year is going to be losing um, 236 billion rand due to load shedding this year. Uh, the stage six load shedding alone is costing the country approximately 900 million rand per day and some of the, the, the problems that we face besides the load shedding is of course the water infrastructure, the water that when the power goes off, we can't pump to tanks. Um, I think Philippa was mentioning earlier that for the last three days, she hasn't had electricity. Unemployment is standing at approximately 35.6% uh, at the moment. We have some odd 20 million people on social grants. The state of our SOEs, our state-owned 
um, companies like Eskom, Transnet, Praza, uh, they're not functioning. The police, the crime rate, municipalities, they're not functioning properly, SAA. Um, and I can carry on. So there's, there's a lot happening. Obviously, we've got um, the government dictating to manufacturers, which is also not um, conducive to everything. Uh, we've got the BE laws, minimum wage, a, a very slow growth economy, and in, in general, the infrastructure, the price of steels, you know, our inflation, interest rates. South Africa doesn't have an Exxon Bank, an export bank. Uh, we've got difficulties with ports, harbors, and our borders. We've got a lot of industrial action. And all of that, our manufacturers have to face on a daily basis. But I think another big problem, and we're going to be addressing this today, is the amount of stuff or products that we import into South Africa. Um, we're importing approximately $759 billion worth of goods into South Africa annually. Um, and that equates to 13.9, call it 14 trillion rand. Um, and if we had to convert part of that, I understand we can't manufacture everything in South Africa, but we are paying manufacturers around the world and we are paying people around the world to manufacture. Our exports that we're doing is about 710 billion rand per annum. And the problem with that is the beneficiation. We are exporting platinum, gold, iron ore, coal, um, iron non -fed, uh, ferrous alloys, manganese. And, and then, of course, in the top 10, we've also got the automotive industry that is exporting, but they are approximately 25% down at the moment. So we've got two types of manufacturers. Obviously, we've got the corporate manufacturers in South Africa, and then we've got the, in the private industry, uh, industry that itself, and uh, we've got about 10,000 small manufacturers. When I say small, ranging from five people to 150 people employed. Um, and there's a, they employ in total about 170,000. So today we need to keep the small companies um, in mind when we're answering um, so that we can give them the answers that we can give them honestly today. So I'm going to start with Philippa. Um, on the first question, Philippa, and, and, and that is your manufacturing circle looking after the local market. As an export council, our uh, mandate is to find markets overseas and to introduce our members and the rest of people that want to export around the world. Um, but you predominantly in the, the local market. So the contribution of manufacturing to South Africa economy has declined in recent decades. In your opinion, what can be done to improve South African manufacturing performances? I'm going to give you three minutes if you can give us an answer or your opinion on that, please, Philippa. Thanks, Eric. Um, one of the, the, the key priority issues that our um, manufacturers indicate as a, as a challenge to um, competitive growth is lack of demand for manufactured products. Um, if we look at the local economy, um, demand for manufactured product is directly linked to GDP growth or lack thereof. So simply put, lack of demand for manufactured product is if we were to prioritize the single most challenging issue that our manufacturing companies face. That is notwithstanding the long laundry list, and I think you have um, given evidence of that, you know, as to the supply side challenges. So as a manufacturing circle, um, identifying opportunities for um, demand for manufactured products on a local basis is one of the areas that we are actively participating in. Um, this, this is conducted um, through some of the work we are doing in um, the Steel Master Plan local demand implementation work stream, where we are looking to identify opportunities for, um, for projects that are going to drive demand 
in this instance, mainly for steel, but also sort of works into the entire value chain. So um, where there may be public procurement opportunities, infrastructure opportunities, private sector demand, what is it that we can do to identify those projects and make sure that um, from, a, from a manufacturing point of view, we have our eye on those projects and those opportunities are availed. Um, you've given me three minutes. I do want to mention, and you did um, table the question to me as, as local um, manufacturer. We are also mindful, given that um, local demand is um, anemic at best, that for our manufacturers to, to, to grow, export um, lead growth is absolutely critical. And that's where you know a lot more than I think we do, Eric. But I do want to note that the two um, work hand in hand. And as Manufacturing Circle, we're also having a look at that um, as to um, companies that are exporting. And I think I'm sure we'll hear a lot more from Thomas about that. That means if you're exporting as a local manufacturer, or by default, you are competitive, despite that long laundry list of challenges. So how do we grow exports? How do we do that by identifying the projects, um, learning from the, the um, companies who are already doing so, and then growing that value chain so that there are also opportunities um, within that value chain for smaller companies to supply into um, the demand side pool. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Philippa. And, and yes, the answer is, as you said, you know, we, there are a lot of companies exporting and they're exporting well. And on this note, I'm going to go over to Thomas and, you know, ask Thomas for his opinion on the South African manufacturer, how they become involved in exports, what they need, what they don't need. Um, and, and, and Thomas's opinion. Thomas, handing over to you. Thanks, Eric. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Three minutes is a bit of a challenge, but... Um, I'll give you five. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't want to bore everybody with a five-minute story, but uh, I'll keep it short. I think uh, um, the Maltec story may not be a unique one. Um, I think it is probably the traditional path of becoming a local champion and, and becoming a successful competitor on the local market. Um, and, and the reason why we went offshore... 25 odd years ago was to grow our market potential, our market, because uh, we dominated in the local market and we needed further growth. So we had to go. And you start with a neighbor, right? So you start with Botswana, Zimbabwe, um, Namibia, Zambia, and you grow from there. So, so the idea of, of garnering enough um, of, a, of a competitive um, product range to justify sending salespeople and putting them into some of the foreign markets. And, uh, you know, we, we're now operating in, in may I say, it, Russia, um, uh, Canada, Australia, any mining jurisdiction, we've got some form of representation. And it all started with, let's go to the neighbor, let's go to Botswana, let's go to Zimbabwe, let's, let's have a product that can compete there. And we, for many years, saw that Africa was our, and still is pretty much our oyster as far as the market is concerned. Our products, of course, are mining related. So, so we, we need to go to where those clients are. And, um, and we're very much a proponent of making products that can hold their own against the imported product. We wouldn't at all endorse protecting local manufactured product because the minute you take it off offshore, um, and as protected here, you're not going to be able to compete in an export environment. So, and then maybe um, uh, you've got to have a shareholder who's got a, a deep pocket, but B, a bit of patience. Um, we've heard many listed entities that have gone, let's say, to Australia. And we know some of our great brands that have gone there and come back with tail between their legs. Sometimes four or five years is not, not enough time to, to make a, a product range viable in a new economy. So you've got to have patient capital. Got to be able to say we're in for the long haul. We know we've got clients that build mines that last 30 to 40, 50 years. Sometimes um, we're not we're not going away, and we're building slowly uh, to to make a, a foreign market viable. And that sometimes takes a long time. So, um, and maybe in, uh, one of the lessons was that whenever you think worked in South Africa, well, you know, you say that to an Australian, and he looks at you and says, 
I don't want your Australian stuff. I want stuff that can compete and be competitive in Australia. So you, you, you have to go through that learning curve. Um, we've currently, our most recent plant that we've, we're setting up in Belo Horizonte in, in, in Brazil, Ainor, which we've got a lot of experience with, we start again because there's a client who's got specific requirements, has got specific needs, um, and in, in Brazil's case, uh, we need to be local. So we can't necessarily export product out of SA. It's not viable in that particular instance. Um, but where we can, we will manufacture and ship out of SA um, and have built a very strong and, and, and capable manufacturing entity with products that are viable on a global stage. And that takes time. I mean, I said we're 50 years old um, and we're still learning. So um, one, one, yeah, you know, one has to play the long game. There's nothing that you're going to do overnight in this space. And um, I think, uh, and just coming to, to, to just back to Eric's list of gloom and doom, one of the challenges and one of the lessons our South Africans clearly have learned a long time ago, you've got to be resilient. Uh, you've got to make a plan. Um, and if you're operating in Africa, guess what? It's, it's, it's easy here in SA. Um, you go to the DRC or Sierra Leone and you've got a whole lot of other challenges to overcome. So once you've mastered those, you'll probably be one, of, one or two other competitors in that market. So the entry barriers are high, but once you're there, you're established um, and you know the rules to operate there. Um, and there's nothing that we do there illegally. We operate um, ethically and, and honestly, and we have made a name for ourselves in those markets. Um, and it's part of the challenge of leading a business. You know, if power goes down, you got to put the generators in, right? So we've got the genies that are in place. Um, if, if our machines stop running, we go, we will, we'll go down the tubes pretty quickly. So we, we had to, we had to already do solar, solar investments, solar plants seven, eight years ago. So we've been running grid tied solar systems for a number of years to, 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 uh, to help our, Power supply and with load shedding, we've had no choice but to put the jennies in. It costs money, and we have to hand. We have to, you know, in the end, the customer pays for it. Um, it's part of the the nature of doing the business here. Um, if you want to be on the African continent, guess what? Um, there are many places where, if you're lucky, you get five or six hours of power a day. So, we 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 adapt ourselves to the environment we're in um, and do the best we can. Um, and we can hold our own against the multinationals, which we're very proud to, to be able to say that and um, have, have a significant export portion. Maybe 60% of our product now um, is exported out of SA, despite all the challenges, despite the issue with uh, freight costs and logistic issues. And remember, your competitor has to do the same. So even the multinational now needs to come in through the same port you're going to be exporting on. So... Um, You've had, you have to overcome them in some form or another. And, you know, I mean, the coal guys last year with, with a booming coal price, if they could get coal onto a ship and whether it was Maputo or Walfus Bay or Durban, they make a plan. They got on a ship and the margins were there and the coal guys made a lot of money last year. So I think we have to be resourceful, agile, whatever the terminology is we use these days. It's part of, I think, in, the, in this uncertainty we're dealing with in the global market and not just a South African problem. It is... And not just an African problem. I mean, that problem persists whether you go to South America or you go into Asia. So um, it's very rare, I think, that 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 the 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 the, the path to the client is an easy one, um, and particularly the more remote they are. So you, you've got to learn those lessons. And I've said for the many years that I've been with the business, there's no textbook. Uh, you've got to transact and learn the hard way. You've got to write the book of mistakes. It has to be your own. Um, that's sort of hopefully uh, enough said for now, um, Eric. Thanks, Thomas. Yes. And, and, you know, as an export council, we know there's no quick fix and you don't export overnight and there's pitfalls and you have to overcome them. And, and it's a challenge. But if you can run a successful business in South Africa under these conditions, you can surely export and, and run a successful um, export company. I'm now going to go to Amit uh, from Nedbank. And, and, then, and the question is to you, what, what is your philosophy at NetBank? I mean, you've heard Thomas and you've heard Philip talk, and we've got, you know, we don't have an Exxon Bank in South Africa. So a lot of smaller companies need pre-shipment finance, post-shipment finance. 
Um, and, and going the export route, you don't always get paid 30 days the way you want to. Um, what is NetBank? How is NetBank facing these challenges with your members or with your um, clients? Yeah, Eric, um, I think an interesting question. So maybe just to go back a little bit longer. So just over about a year and a half ago, um, we put together or refined our client value proposition uh, for the manufacturing sector. And, and the reason that we, we refined and redefined our value proposition is as, as a result of your shopping list of challenges that's faced by many South Africans. And, and again, there's, there's, there's local challenges, there's global challenges, and it was absolutely imperative for us to firstly understand what's going on in the sector, what is the nuances with the sector, and then further so is understand what's keeping our clients up at night. So, you know, premised on those two concepts, we developed a value proposition, which was key and important and integral for us to do so with that amount of diligence to be relevant into the market. Now, when we go back into funding and post-shipment funding, pre-shipment funding, and, and, and the entire funding process, I think it's gone with the days where, where banks need to offer or give you a product off the shelf, you know, with standard interest rates, standard terms, uh, standard repayment conditions. That off-the-shelf product doesn't exist. That world doesn't exist anymore. So something that we, you know, we really pride ourselves in at, at NetBank is to understand our clients' business, understand what their strategy is, and partner with them in achieving their strategic objectives. And that's not, you know, done through off-the-shelf services. We need to go out and, and deliver tailored solutions, tailored funding solutions to our clients. And, you know, again, uh, while the tailored approach does somewhat take a little bit longer, we are extremely cognizant of the fact that execution is, is integral here. You know, the speed of execution fluctuations can impact and influence business very radically uh, over a short space of time. So, you know, our approach has been shifted quite dynamic, dynamically over the last few years. And, you know, a, a lot of us make mention of COVID and some of the other challenges that we face. And, uh, you know, we, we can't run away from them. But the reality is, it is sometimes that these challenges that we, we are facing uh, is giving us opportunities to be better as banks and to develop more innovative solutions to our clients. Thank you for that. And I, and I think you're right. And if you have a look at some of the industries uh, and the people we speak to in industry, that um, during COVID and the year after COVID has been their best ever years in, in manufacturing. Um, the Rand dollar obviously also helps a lot um, with the export. And, 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 and as uh, Thomas rightly said, all the countries are facing challenges. If you look at China, if you look at India, Brazil, they're all facing certain challenges. So we have got the opportunity um, to do that. I would now like to go to, to Fritzwa and ask from a CIFSA point, how, what is your experience in the marketplace at the moment? Um, and, and, and what do you see happening in the future for our manufacturing that uh, where CIFSA gets involved on a daily day basis? All right, um, thanks, Eric. Um, I think uh, I want to agree with the point Philippa made about uh, for us, what we are seeing on a day-to-day -day is the lack of demand. But what I want to do is add, an, add a nuance to that point. And that's really the fact that what we have seen, and this is really the antithesis to local manufacturing and local cap capability that is building it, in, and that's particularly the state and the public uh, procurement. And what we've typically seen there um, is the in the public procurement uh, area, what you have typically is big bang, um, stop start type of uh, demand from that side. So that, that, that affects the sort of demand profile. And I mean, a number of examples highlight that. Uh, you just have to look at Madupi and Kusilia, which were last minute projects, big bang, that chokes local manufacturers. You look at the REAP projects uh, around 2015, 16, where there was a stop start uh, approach uh, to them um, for many reasons that we know. You look at uh, the, the Sanro projects of last year, equally the same thing. There were big bang, there were short, uh, they, they, they were, they were, they were short term in nature. And, and then and naturally they then had to be exported. You then had a lot of uh, um, uh, uh, foreign players coming in there. You also have, um, the, the list is endless. Uh, you even have an area that we're working on quite a bit with uh, the manufacturing circle, and that's around the transmission um, development plan. And that's really the fact that if not developed and communicated to industry, you run the risk of it being fast-tracked for the fact that it is also a 
urgent way to unlock the electricity grid. And that's and, and then you then also have this big bang stop start approach. And also you have the public procurement regulation. So really the point, Eric, is that um, this stop start approach uh, and also big bang order, orders, as I've said, is really the antithesis to, to, to local manufacturers actually building domestic capacity. And what it then really just promotes is a, is a import and install because you're actually not too sure when the next when the next uh, orders will be. So that's that's really an area that we have been actively working on, particularly from a uh, from a public procurement. And why I highlighted that angle is because for the sector that we represent, uh, state procurement or public procurement represents about 23% of the total sector. But some of our sectors, like the electrotech as well as valves and the rest, um, state procurement makes up as much as 60%. So in that sense, then that's an area that we think. Um, if, if a lot more effort can be put, particularly from a state point of view, uh, in terms of uh, communicating, developing procurement plans long term, communicating those to industry for industry then to, to, to develop um, long term capacity to feed into that. Um, later on, maybe we can always unpack some of the supply side issues that we are working on. But of course, um, um, load shedding, I think, is a major one for us. And uh, I'll be happy to unpack later a survey that we did in terms of just putting some numbers to the impact of that. Thanks, Eric. Thank you very much. Let's go over to Gaynor now. And uh, from a TIPS point of view, the electricity and, and, and the deregulation of privatization or government electricity going to privatization. What is your opinion on, on, on the solution to this, Galo? Yeah, thanks, Eric. Um, and look, I think we've we've heard, you know, the challenges and, and certainly I think electricity supply, energy security more broadly is the single largest uh, impediment to the economy at the moment. But I'd say it's also probably the main driver of investment at the moment in the economy. Uh, certainly uh, the opening up of the electricity market burst in, in, in 2021 uh, briefly and then you know, fundamentally uh, in, in December of 2022 with the removal of the licensing requirement has really unleashed um, quite a sizable quite a sizable market uh, in terms of investment uh, into renewable energy. I think everyone and anyone who's got the means uh, is, is, is investing in renewable energy and, and storage at the moment. And, and we see that already, you know, even though it's quite early days, as I said, you know, the full uh, reform came in in December of last year, so a little bit more than four months. We already see that in the numbers, you know, if you look at the numbers of projects that have been registered by uh, by our regulator, NERSA, just in the first quarter of this year, uh, uh, 2.5 gigawatts of projects you know, registered by the private sector at, at NERSA, you know, just in one quarter, in three months. You know, uh, for reference, in 2022, we did about 1.7 gigawatt. Uh, that was kind of with a, a midterm kind of opening. Uh, in 2021, when it was not open, uh, we were at less than 100 megawatts, okay? So that's really kind of sizable ramping up of projects. And if we believe the data coming out of coming out of ESCOM as of February, there's up to 13 gigawatts of projects into the pipeline, all right? So it's really sizable amount of investment that is coming, uh, of course, driven by, by energy security concerns, but also driven by just the simple economics of it. Uh, it's now just cheaper to build your own system than to, to, to get supply from ESCOM. And increasingly for exporters, the need to show that you're going to have low carbon electricity so that you don't suffer, you know, border carbon taxes and the likes. So I think we, we're seeing a massive, a massive opportunity I think coming in, 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 in terms of manufacturing because of course, the key question for us here today is, well, massive demand for renewable energy. Okay, that's coming, you know. Hopefully we don't have the stop start anymore that was mentioned. Now it's gonna be Musa ramping up both the public and the private side, 
you know, just for reference to the public side, uh, over the last 10 years, we, we ran uh, a little bit more than 6,000 megawatts. So just, just to put into perspective the numbers that I said. But can we supply that through manufacturing? You know, and, and what we're seeing right now in the data over the last few months is a massive ramp up of imports of solar panels, of inverters, of batteries. You know, it's really growing exponentially. Uh, I think you know the numbers are quite are quite staggering in terms of what we've we've been importing, you know, and, and you know I think we need to now ask ourselves the question: Why can we make locally? You know, as you said in the introduction, it's not necessarily about making everything, but certainly there are many opportunities. You know, if we start disaggregating what we can make locally into a solar plant, a wind farm, a lithium ion battery, or even a vanadium based battery, there's a lot that we can make. And there's a lot that we're already making. So I think we need now to discuss how do we impact that? How do we set the scene for our local manufacturers, our local suppliers to answer you know, and supply that demand? And then hopefully then get competitive, obviously, to, to, to export going forward. So I think that's that's the picture that we're looking at at the moment. And, uh, and I think a lot of opportunities you know, doesn't take away all the challenges, but certainly I think it's it's opening up an avenue for, for growth and development uh, in the economy. Thank you. And I've been looking at, at, at some of the questions that some of our viewers uh, have put, and the one is the Africa free trade. Philippa, can I ask you to comment on the Africa free trade and how it's affected um, your members and from there, I'm going on to uh, Thomas, and I'll ask everybody the same question, because obviously the Africa Free Trade Agreement is an important agreement for the African doing business. So over to you, Philippa. Thanks, Eric. Um, the Africa uh, Continental Free Trade Area Agreement is, is you know, in, in, in theory and high level, very, very a, 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 a very important opportunity, um, you know, in terms of providing access to, um, let's say, a larger market um, as far as um, uh, South Africa from an export point of view is concerned. Um, there is a lot of work that needs to be done. Um, from an implementation perspective, um, you know, there are agreements in place, there's a lot of discussions and negotiations around um, the various trade blocks, um, the various uh, tariff agreements, and also um, not to forget the non-tariff barriers from a logistics perspective in terms of how um, um, the, the um, opportunities are, are deployed. So um, from our perspective, um, I mean, we've had examples from Multitech, for example, which happens to be a manufacturing um, circle member as to the areas that um, are being um, accessed and exported to. Um, as far as, a, and, and we're really looking at this from a, from, um, a multi-pronged approach. Um, we need to understand what our trade interests are. Um, South African manufacturers, um, what are the products that we are exporting? Where to? To which countries? Um, what are our expansionary interests? Um, what are, for example, our defensive interests where it comes to imports? And how do we navigate that within a um, you know, within a regional value chain. So um, these these may be like slightly uh, broad um, answers. Um, I guess what I'm trying to say, Eric, is that um, there's there is opportunity, but there's a lot of work to be done in terms of what it, how can we deploy, um, you know, various solutions whilst navigating the various agreements and trade blocks. So from an industry point of view, we need to get a lot more savvy and proactive in terms of where the agreements are sitting, where the opportunities are sitting, and how we can um, inform our South African trade negotiators in that regard. 
We also need to understand the um, non-tariff barriers and where and how we can look to um, addressing those. To Thomas's point, um, that I would assume is one of the reasons why Malta Tech first looked towards neighboring countries from a logistics perspective. A lot of our exports are um, directly to SADC because it's quite easy to export from a, from a road perspective. Um, and then um, more specifically, I'll, I'll cite another example in our steel master plan implementation export work stream, where we are looking to try to identify um, as various pilot projects, where could there be countries or project opportunities that we could look to, to access um, applying an SA Inc. Um, a perspective that may have different definitions across um, different parties, but broadly speaking, how is it that we can deploy um, an understanding across um, our technical expertise within a value chain and our funding expertise um, and seeing as and where we can open up those opportunities, also working together with our government counterparties to um, start implementing on, on various project opportunities. Thanks, Thanks Eric. Uh, a quick answer. Thomas, has it benefited you at all? Can you see the benefits of it? Or are we still too far away from seeing direct benefits from the so, so there's two answers here. One is a pragmatic one. Whatever my competitor has to do, I have to do. So, you know, in the end, the hurdle is a hurdle. And as long as the hurdle is applied equally, the difficulty is the same for everyone. Um, so, so the pragmatic side of me says... Um, it'll take some time and um, um, it'll be the same playing field for everyone else. So it doesn't make that much of a difference for us. The only benefit we have as a local South African manufacturer as opposed to a multinational importer into Africa, they have a few more hurdles to overcome than us. Um, but no doubt on the theoretical level, we're dealing with a, a market with a billion up and coming people with uh, upwardly mobile and, and lifestyle requirements. You've got Minerals that are, are seen as critical green industry minerals, the, 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 the battery minerals that are in demand in Central Africa in particular, um, that growth is coming. And I mean, the level that we can make the playing field, the quicker we can get product through the borders with less duties and less delays, um, it makes everything quick. I mean, I think around the world trip on a plane is cheaper than a fl flight to, to, to Williamson Diamond Mine in Tanzania. So it's still prohibitive to get around Africa um, in any form, whether you're transporting stuff or taking a human, um, it, 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 it's, it, and, and it makes everything far more expensive. So the, 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 the ability to be able to open up the borders, move stuff quickly, get the infrastructure going. So I'm fully for us being able to, and we know the European model is, the Europeans trade with Europeans primarily, um, and that's where the growth lies rather than, um, you know, getting it onto a ship. So, so I, I, I'm all for it, but I know this is going to, those are, those are, those, that mileage, um, and you, we're going to have to have some patience because I don't think that's going to happen quickly. And Philip is right. There's a lot of work required, and you've, you're fighting some countervailing forces there. But it is in all of our interests for that to happen um, as quickly as possible. Thank you for that, um, Thomas. Yes, it's, it's, it's interesting. Um, you know, we've, if you have a look at the at the global picture and if I'm looking at some of the questions that our viewers are asking, um, things like collaboration between companies. Um, I've always said as an export council and, and having exported all my life myself, you cannot do this alone. You need to you need to form partnerships, whether you form a partnership in a foreign country, whether you open your own business and you register your own business. Um, you cannot just do all of this alone. So that, that's interesting. And I think what you have said there as well, uh, Thomas, you know, the competition is the same. It doesn't matter what you do. I'd like to now go back to um, Sifsa and, and, and ask um, Sifsa, you, you said earlier on that you, you've got some stats that you want to share with us. Would you like to share that now with us? I'm happy to, Eric, uh, but if I can just touch on this Africa free trade um, uh, point, uh, Eric, very quickly, and that's to just highlight the fact that um, an interesting structural break happened um, for the steel and engineering sector. That's around about 2008, where pre-2008, the, the 
um, largest export market for the sector. So we're looking at across 11 sub industries that we call steel and engineering. The largest export market was Europe. When these 2008 uh, um, 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 global financial crisis happened, a structural break where happened where Africa then overtook that and to become the largest export market. So right now I mentioned earlier on that the sector exports 40% of uh, 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 output that's on a value basis. And of that 40%, 40% also goes into Africa. But what has very, been very interesting for us is when you look at the fact that the sector has also been in a multi-year structural decline since 2008, measured at 1.3% on a compound annual basis, what also contributes to that, that I 100% agree that Africa does offer some of a lot of opportunity geographically um, um, and, and just how we are st strategically located and South Africa being the most important, um, most important, uh, well, most industrialized economy. But uh, when, when you do look at the quality of the demand profile also from African uh, countries, in fact, in, at the beginning of last year, we, at the beginning of this year, we, we put out our, our, our annual state of the sector report. And, in, and we run a comprehensive model in terms of where we model what we look at the outlook to be. And really the point there, what we did is we did uh, build in quite a punitive assumption around some of that African demand being when you look at what's happening in Ghana, when you look at what's happening in, in, in Kenya and also some issues around Zambia in terms of refinancing of debt and all of that, those fiscal vulnerabilities, particularly in this current economic environment does affect the quality of demand that comes out of those, um, those economies. So I think I agree with the comment said earlier on that while it presents a significant opportunity, um, the quality of demand does have some um, weak spots and mostly it's because of um, a fiscally vulnerable, vulnerable um, sectors. So I, I, maybe I'll, I'll leave it at that, um, um, Eric, and just, just to highlight that point, because for us, it is an important market, but we do think those fiscal vulnerabilities do affect the quality of demand of the continent. Thanks. Thank you very much, Shashwin. Um, Gaynor, from the African Free Trade, what your experience regarding the investments that we can expect from this, if there are any. Yeah, I think look, I think I share the sentiment. You know, uh, it's it's potentially uh, really going to drive a lot of opportunities. Um, but I think those, in most cases, still have to materialize. And and I think you know, when you look at when you look at renewable energy, for instance, there's there's a massive need. And there's a gigantic potential latent demand. But whether that demand actually materializes uh, is, uh, is the question. It will in some contexts. I think certainly, you know, when we see the plans that are unfolding in, you know, in, in, in Morocco, in Egypt, and in a few other countries, there's, there's, there's a big drive there for renewable energy. Um, but, but I think... You know, in many countries, things are quite uh, are quite uh, hindered and and very slow. So I think we yet to see we yet to see that market happening. Um, I think where there's some potential opportunities, I think it was mentioned, is around regional integration around certain value chain. And here, certainly, the development of batteries, lithium-ion batteries, is something that that is worth looking at. You know, if you look at the, the minerals um, to make a lithium ion battery over the African continent. It's simple, we have them all, okay? Um, but no country has them all, okay? We need to look at it holistically. Um, there's lots of manganese in South Africa, there's lithium in Zimbabwe, you know, you get uh, bauxite in Guinea, you get cobalt in DRC and, 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 and you know, copper as well. Uh, many others. So how can we get a regional integration strategy that says, okay, if we're serious about it, you know, how do we leverage the minerals that we have to uh, improve our own beneficiation? And if the end goal is to produce batteries, I think the mineral is not enough. You need the demand. It comes top down. So then what's the partnership with the key demand drivers, primarily the automotive industry and the energy industry to then uh, build those value chains. If we tackle it bottom up from the minerals and top down from the key OEMs that they are in energy or in, in automotive, 
then I think you know there's some really great opportunities. Um, maybe first at the SADC level, and then and then you know maybe at the African continent level further uh, later on. But I think we have to be concrete about it. Look at it when we have the opportunities, uh, and, and that's how I think we can tap into into you know the prospects of the CFTA and, and other regional integration op operations. Good, thank you. <clears throat> now I'd like to ask Emmett, and I see from one of the questions is. And of course, the question is always going to be about finance. Um, does the banks make funding for small, medium enterprise easy? And how do they make it easier for the small guy to actually export? Yeah. So yeah, funding will always be a pertinent question, uh, you know, and, and it's, it's definitely no secret that in order for any sector, industry or business to grow, it requires funding. I think the, the one thing that we need to understand and understanding quite quite carefully so is that in any from any bank, uh, you know, albeit I'm representing NetBank today, you know, whatever funding is applied from a banking perspective or in NetBank's in, in NetBank's view, we need to understand the business case and understand the business integrally. So when when we look at to support small businesses, there's definitely a strategic intent from from a NetBank's perspective to support manufacturing. Hence, you know, a little bit earlier on, I spoke about. Uh, refining and reviving our, our solution to the specific industry. We understand the importance of, of the manufacturing sector to the economy. Um, and, and definitely, you know, while there is no preferential, uh, you know, rates and, and those type of things, which, which I think would be reckless for any bank to do by, by, by that means, uh, I, I think the difference that we can add to, to the sector and to the business from a funding perspective is integrally understanding the sector, uh, the industry, what's happening from a nuances perspective, Again, that, you know, Philip, I spoke about it earlier on, you know, understanding the value chain and how one impacts the other. Um, so when it comes to finding SMEs, we're definitely keen for this. We're definitely in the business to do that. I think the reality is, uh, you know, quite often our clients uh, tend to misunderstand when, when funding is not approved or, or not granted adequately. The reality is, is that we make money from funding businesses out there. You know, that, that is the reality, but not from writing off losses. So any business case needs to be solid, it needs to be funded. Uh, but it, as a bank, we want to partner with our clients out there to actually understand, you know, where are they going to and how do we support this growth? Um, it, it's bigger than just uh, it's bigger than just the business. I think it's it's more so economy, it's more so society as well. Thank you. <clears throat> a question for Multitech is, and the question is, do you guys collaborate with other companies or do you go solo? all the way and it's an interesting question and you know a lot of times for the smaller guy it's not that easy to go solo but thomas please um let's answer the gentleman's question so um we we have uh, our friends at the competition commission who we need to always acknowledge have it a purpose and a duty to ensure that there's no collusion and no abuse of sharing information um, and uh, for Multitech, what we have done, um, ironically, um, because of our wide portfolio of products, we supply our multinationals with some product and we buy some product from them. And on occasion, we collaborate. Um, you have to be wary, of course. Um, and then with the smaller businesses, I think the, the, the challenge is there. Um, there are institutions such as the manufacturing circles, such as SACIC, and then in our particular instance, the South African Mineral Processing um, uh, Cluster, which uh, does have smaller players, and then the facilitation of, of um, access to different markets and, and, and the support thereof. So, I mean, we do, we do share notes um, with the smaller players. We do get together in this forum, in particular SAMPIC. Um, so, so we have done it from time to time. I think we could do more of that. Um, I mean, the Competition Commission is always focused on, on nailing you within country, but the minute you go and walk into Zimbabwe together, no one's going to complain about that. So, you know, it's maybe not, we haven't necessarily done enough of that, but that can be, and we've always offered for smaller players to, to use some of our um, foreign branches access into, into, those, uh, into those markets. And um, I mean, Eric, yourself and Saki, uh, uh, facilitate many, many um, international um, conferences or shows where you assist uh, the local players. So 
I, I, I do believe we can do more. Um, and, and I think if we do uh, collectively focus more singularly on the African market, we could probably be better at it. I think this notion that we're part of BRICS and that we can compete in Brazil or in, in China or in India, I think that for a small player is, is, is I think, a bridge too far, but uh, not for the rest of Africa. I think, as, as, as you rightly said, um, you know, even in SACIC, we, we always promote that our members look at successful people and join successful people. Uh, success breeds success. Um, you know, we, we help a lot of people all over the show. We do a lot of exhibitions. We do a lot of inward buying missions and outward selling missions. Um, and, and just to give you an idea, we've got the local manufacturing expo happening next year in uh, September together with Electro Mining Africa. Um, and we're relaunching the the local, the Southern African local manufacturing expo, which focuses on the, the SACIC region. And I, and I think that that is where people need to start and they need to, you know, we, we work on a tier one to a tier four. And for people that don't know what a tier one to tier four is, you get your OEMs that like um, Multitech, et cetera. And then you get the smaller guys, like one of our, our sponsors today, Kimberley Engineering Foundry. And, and the foundries, they supply castings to other companies. So there's, there's a lot of tier ones, tier twos, and tier three companies or smaller companies that are exporting their product. They are just supplying it to an OEM who in turn then exports the product. So there, there's a lot of this happening. And uh, so, so it's, it's good that, that things like this can happen. But if, if I go back to, to Glenor, what is your perspective on, on the manufacturing sector as per se, excluding the investment, excluding the electricity? What, do, what is your prediction of the manufacturing, either the both the small and the medium in, in the TIPS setup? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, uh, from, a, from a broad manufacturing perspective, it's 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 a it's a really tough equation to to solve at the moment. I think we you know I think we've been discussing at large all the challenges and and I think until until some of those are are, are being are being uh, addressed, uh, we, we're not going to see the kind of growth that we that we want and the kind of you know economic development and, and employment creation that we want. And I think that is um, that is pretty obvious. I think you know everybody is, is aware of that. Um, that's kind of the elephant in the room. Um, at the same time, I think we've got got pretty resilient uh, industries in, in South Africa. I mean, you know, if you think that we've been dealing with load shedding for about fifteen years now, uh, not to the extent that we've had today. Uh, it hasn't always been as bad, but but I mean, you know, it has been it's part of the picture for a while. So I think it's about shifting a bit some of those um those perspectives going forward one one thing that that worries me deeply for south africa's manufacturing is the is the rise of of border carbon taxes um and, and that is you know something that we've been talking for a while but it's actually around the corner the eu is going to put a carbon tax at its border starting uh, effectively October of this year. Okay. So if you want to export to the EU, and just for reference, but 19% of South Africa's exports go to the EU, right? It's obviously more in some industries than others. Um, with that carbon tax coming, uh, it's going to really make it harder and harder to access the European market if you haven't decarbonized your electricity supply and your uh, manufacturing process. And of course, from a South African perspective, we know. We're one of the most carbon intensive economies globally. So there's a really a, 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 an amazing challenge ahead of us because we also know that the European scheme is the, uh, the tree that eyes the forest. You know, once this is in place, you can count on it. The UK, Japan, the US, Canada, who are all already looking at it, and then it will be the rest of the world. So if you're an exporter today, you know, it's going to become really uh, a key constraint going forward. Um, but you know, the other side of the coin is true. 
if you can decarbonize, ensure that you have, then lies opportunity. Because of course, then that market becomes available to you uh, and you have then a, a very clear advantage in accessing those markets going forward. So, so I think for me, that's going to reshape a lot of the trade dynamics, uh, certainly towards the global north in in uh, in, the, in the years to come. And I think in the longer term, uh, globally, whether we can rise to the challenge, I guess, is, is the question here. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> One of the other questions, and this was for Philippa, Philippa um, is, is the, the support given by the DTIC and other government into local manufacturing. Um, would you like to elaborate on that, your experience of that, give the viewers a fair idea? Um, but before you do that, I've always said that, then, and I think Thomas said it earlier this morning, and, and so did Sipsa and, and the banks, you have to do it on your own and you have to find your own partners. But give us your perspective of this, Philip, seen as it was one of our questions from a viewer. Um, I will answer that, Eric, but I want to just um, pre uh, premise my my comments. Um, I think just as to to where this the where this conversation is going, as to how do we best focus and apply our energies and work smart from a manufacturing perspective to sustain and grow this industry. Um, you know, because we, we're talking on the one hand about um, immediate challenges. Um, Gaylor has um, raised the issue of carbon border adjustment mechanism, what that does in the future, and how do we navigate the space, including what sort of support do we get from our um, government's counterparties. So um, I'd like to make one or two comments, which will also answer your question. Um, I think first and foremost, um, how do we how do we get back to a virtuous demand cycle for manufacturing? I see one of the questions or comments in the chat box was, "What am I missing? Is it just about price? Won't that deal with um, demand?" So this virtuous demand cycle: if we increase demand for manufactured products, we get economies of scale, um, and in so doing, we are more we become more competitive. Um, and I think that talks to Tafatwa's point as well about from a government's perspective, um, smoothing demand for procurement. So it's not bang and bust. So that maybe talks to our DTIC um, colleagues and we're working with them in our steel master plan, local demand and export demand work streams, for example. Where can we get the message across? Because the DTIC in some instances is the custodian for industrialization in governments, but those are also sometimes silos. How do we get that point across? Um, and if the DTIC can help us, Eskom, you're a procurer. You've got 12,000 kilometers of transmission line that needs to be built. We've seen a transmission development plan. That, however, is a wish list. What is the execution plan? What is going to be um, 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 put out on an RFQ basis and when so that industry can prepare for it because we've got the capabilities, but we need to decide if we're going to ramp up or not from a capacity perspective. So that's the one answer for you, um, Eric, I think, as far as DTIC in terms of being a custodian for industrialization within government and assisting business. And business also needs to take a lead as to what is it we need to know? What is it we need to see? There's a big um, a critical infrastructure project um, gazetted um, a project, the Wheeler Seasway Bridge Program that's been gazetted for years. Is that coming? When is that going to be procured? Do, can we get the DTIC to assist us um, as far as understanding those RFQs that are going to come up so that local industry is envisaged and contemplated so that we can play a meaningful role in those um, tenders? So um, I guess in my long-winded sort of way, Eric, um, there are also many incentives I believe we've got to, we, and that starts, I guess, with us as industry and working with our, with our um, broader uh, colleagues as and where we can, we've got to get more focused and we've got to work smarter. And the underpin to that is 
how are we more competitive? If we are more competitive and the likes of Multitech who are exporting 60% of their, um, you know, 60% of their revenue, as, as, as Thomas has said, is from, from exports. That means by default, Multitech is competitive despite all of these challenges. And to your point, Eric, um, I, I, I have, we hold the same view as Manufacturing Circle. Those pockets of excellence by way of um, um, uh, uh, companies or organizations or individuals how do we how do we learn from those how do we make those into centers of excellence we've got our square kilometer array um, the best radio radio telescope in the world we've got the engineering competencies so how do we and I think to Gaylor's point as far as um, our energy space is concerned building transmission lines, and also the renewable energy space. What are we already good at by way of transmission lines, by way of balance of plant? How do we get visibility from the procurers as to what sort of work is coming up so that we as industry can enable ourselves to access that? Those would be my, um, my thoughts and suggestions, Eric. Oh, thank you. I know, I, I know. And, and from our side or from the SACIC side, um, a lot of our members are already busy with green technology, green manufacturing. And, you know, you heard Thomas saying that people are with electricity, but besides that, it's using recyclable material, um, putting less pollution into the skies, into the air. Um, and, and we're well aware of the fact that if we're going to export um, to Europe, and I think our exports to Germany alone is 8.2%, United Kingdom is 5%, Japan 4%, Netherlands 4%, um, Belgium 2.8%. So, you know, our exports are good. So I think, our, um, and Thomas mentioned it, you know, our, our, our manufacturers are very resilient on this and our manufacturers are up to date. Um, I think, and that that's part of, you know, if you're going to become an exporter, um, or if you're going to become a manufacturer that counts, you, you're going to take note of all of this stuff and you are going to do the right thing. Otherwise, you're not going to be exporting or you're not going to be manufacturing, you know, whether you, you're manufacturing for the local market or whether you're manufacturing for the export market. It, it, it stays the same. We have to be competitive and we have to, we have to comply to the international rules and the international laws. We've got a couple of minutes left, so I'm going to go around and ask each one let us have a look and, and, and let's give every or your opinion to our manufacturers out there. Um, I've seen a lot of the questions. Unfortunately, we can't get to every question. And, you know, we can't ask every panelist to answer the same question in their opinion. But I'm, I'm going to start with Tafizwa. And on, on closing out, what do our, and this is going to be the same question to all our panelists. And as Tafizwa is finished, I'm going to go to the next one, is... Say something that gives hope to somebody in South Africa manufacturing that says, well, it's worth waking up tomorrow and it's worth taking the risk of manufacturing and it's worth the trouble. Can I ask you, Sapiro? Thanks uh, for that. Yeah, carry on, sorry. Yeah, th thank you, Eric. Uh, so, sorry if I jumped in there. Um, Eric, I, I think it was Gaylor who mentioned earlier on that what, keep, what keeps uh, the, 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 the green, the the area of opportunity for us is that South Africa presents the most industrialized uh, economy on the continent. And that in itself, so that in there you talk about resilience, despite all the challenges that the economy has gone through, uh, manufacturers have proved resilience. I mean, if I can just give you some steel sector stats that just prove the level of opportunity, which I then hope gives that uh, element of hope and, and, and a good story from at least a steel sector point of view, that if you look at steel production relative to global total, South Africa ranks relatively small at about 0.3%. If you look at Africa, um, uh, South Africa steel production relative to Africa, you, are, you come up to about 45, 46%. But if you take out the Northern African countries and you just look at Sub-Saharan Africa, so the 46 countries coming down, you're looking at about 96%. That's South Africa's steel production relative to that, uh, re relative to that total. So the point really is that from a potential point of view, from an industrialized economy point of view, and also 
despite what a lot of things we may say about the policy landscape, South Africa does, does still present a relatively stable policy environment with uh, property rights protected, et cetera. Um, I think, Thomas, you mentioned it earlier that um, just operating on the rest of the continent is a much, much different, is a much different landscape than South Africa. Just from a, from a, from a regulatory point of view, from a stability point of view, as well as just even the deep um, uh, financial and sophisticated financial services sector um, uh, with, with, the, with, with the local banks playing a big role in that. So I think bringing all of that together does present a massive opportunity for us to take over domestic and the export market. Um, but a lot of the policy interventions really have to be brought together. And that's where the private sector and the state needs to pay, play a, a massive role. And I'll, I'll end on the point that in that massive role that the private sector and government need to play, in the state bringing the private sector in, it should not be notional or platform position, but really it should be genuine participation where the private sector can play a role in shaping what the outcomes of uh, the country, the outcomes that we want to see. So thanks, Eric, and I appreciate that uh, question. That's my Thank you. The same question goes to Amit from Nedbank. Amit, what do you, your final word to the, to the listeners? Yeah, thanks, Eric. So, I mean, it's a pity we, we're almost out of time because the conversation is quite intriguing. I want to start off by saying I think necessity is the mother of invention. And, and we've seen this happening over a number of years. Uh, as South Africans, we've overcome many a disasters, you know, some globally, some naturally, some brought upon ourselves. Uh, I, I think message out there is that it's not all doom and gloom. Uh, we've, we've overcome some great difficulties in the past, and we're bound to overcome these difficulties moving forward. Uh, yes, load shedding is a big challenge, and 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 we're going to overcome it. You know, there's a big uptick, a big adoption of sustainable energy, which is driving you know the circular economy, which is accelerating our our let's call it conformity to what the EU expects us to do. So yes, load shedding is not good, but it's accelerating our compliance to the circular economy, and there's some benefits and positives to that. You know, I really want to encourage people out there to to utilize. Uh, you know, local uh, production facilities. Uh, let us support local, let's collaborate together, you know, across industries uh, between government and private sector. Um, I think this is the time where we need to rally together to overcome some of these obstacles. And from an energy banking perspective, we're here to support the industry, we're here to support the growth of this industry uh, and, 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 you know, make long flourish and we can and we should be playing on the global platform for a long time. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Dalo, what? <clears throat> sorry, your, your uh, response to the last question. What do we say to our manufacturing members? We, we say it's a good place to, to do business in South Africa. Uh, you know, I think uh, I hear a, a lot of doom and gloom a lot. And I think, you know, we mustn't shy away from the challenges. Uh, we, we have challenges, but, but I think we need to also look around. And I think it's been shared today that uh, South Africa is still a very stable economy. You know, um, every country has its issues. And actually, if you look at you know the economic environment in, in the country, it, it's better than virtually most places uh, uh, you know, globally. You know, there's no point comparing ourselves to you know a few exceptions that are doing very very well. You know, you know if we compare to the rest of the globe, we actually. You know we're doing we're doing quite well, um, and, and of course, it's been said we we're very resilient. You know, um, you know. So for me, uh, if we can leverage the pockets of excellence that we have, um, because it, virtually every single industry you look at, we have pockets of excellence. You know, I, I cannot think of a single value chain that you know we we, we don't have a role in. You know. Uh, not necessarily a leader in every of them, you know, but we we have some some pockets of excellence, and I think that's really important that we that we leverage those. And and I think the last the last point for me is that you know I'm I'm quite optimistic actually on uh, our prospect of resolving load shedding going forward. Um, I know it's been you know it, it's been going worse and worse. But the recent reforms really, I think, and the the literally um, exponential investment in renewable energy will 
by itself you know, resolve at least the, the bulk of load shedding uh, fairly rapidly. Um, you know, and, and so for me, you know, certainly from, from kind of within a year's time, things will be a lot more stable in that respect. Uh, and, and that should then enable us to leverage our pockets of excellence, to leverage our resilience, and to and to you know uh, leverage the fact that we actually quite a quite a you know a, a stable economy in, in that respect. So you know, I'm I'm optimistic on that. I know it's not easy to be optimistic every day, uh, but I think uh, you know we are seeing hopefully uh, the light uh, at uh, the end of the tunnel. Thank you, Clayton. Philippa, ask you the same question. What hope are we going to give our manufacturers, big and small, to continue manufacturing, to grow the manufacturing sector, employ people and export? Challenges inform opportunities. Um, uh, as an example, Manufacturing Circle and CIFSA are aligned and working together as to from a metals and indus engineering industries value chain perspective, what are our manufacturers doing at a company level, at a factory level, from a demand side management perspective, um, as far as industrial energy efficiency um, implementation is concerned? to um, be more effective and use less of, of what we do have um, in order to look to bridging the demand and supply gap. In addition, what is it that um, companies are doing to look at alternative sources of um, electricity to the extent that they are feasible? And furthermore, which of our member companies can actually supply in to that energy build space, um, wherever it sits within the value chain, if it's transmission lines or um, uh, pylons, transformers, um, balance of plants and the like. Um, and really, I'd like to just conclude with something that I believe very, very strongly in, Eric, is that manufacturers make things, manufacturers fix things, and manufacturers make things happen. Thanks. Absolutely. I can't agree with you more being in manufacturing all my life. Thomas, last word for yourself. Same question as I asked all the four other panelists. Yeah, thanks. My head's spinning into all sorts of directions here, but um, I just have to caution um, that we get uh, too carried away with our optimism. Um, I think as an industrialized economy in, in the tip of Africa, that advantage is slipping as our neighbors start getting uh, more industrialized themselves. And, and Zambia in particular has a particularly um, ambitious president who's saying all the right things. I'm uh, and we sense also doing the right things, and um, that's to the benefit of the Zambian economy. And um, that becomes a competitor in its own right, just not just as a, a you know as a co company in that country, but as a whole country. And it's attracting investment there. So I think we, as a country, we 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 mustn't rest too much on our laurels. Uh, as far as having this industrialized base, we need to. We, we need to see that we need to upgrade our ability to be able to compete um, in a relatively, let's say, I mean, you know, you, you talk about Botswana going down a couple of nights ago, 600 megawatts of power gone, 600, not even a meg, uh, gig, right, in compared to our 20 plus gigawatts, a relatively small economy. Um, so we have relatively small and not industrialized neighbors, but they're growing and they're doing things, they're getting investment, they, 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 they're doing the right thing. So um, caution to, to us, um, and, and I think many multinational companies have bypassed South Africa and invested elsewhere because they're saying um, South Africans are too inwardly focused. They're trying to set, set themselves up to do business with each other, but our market sits outside of SA. On top, you know, We need to focus on building companies that come here and want to service Africa. Um, and I think last, the last message is, is um, and, and it's been said before, these centers of excellence. Um, uh, how often have you heard the expression, well, what do you expect this is Africa? In other words, you diminish, we diminish ourselves as South Africans when we say we can't be world-class and we can't make world-class products. 
And I challenge everybody on this forum to say that mindset you should remove because it, with, with the, we have all the ability, we have all the skills and we have all the potential to be gl uh, global players. But you have to believe it. The leadership in an organization has to believe it. And if they believe it, you can go anywhere in the world with the products we make, with the people that wherever they come from, if they come out of Santon or they come out of a township next to Santon, those people can make world-class products. You've got to believe it. Um, and it's possible. I, I'm, I'm a big fan of, 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 of our ability to, to, to produce world-class products, but it's the leadership that have to own it. We can't expect um, the workforce to take that on. They, they will make what is expected of them. Mercedes-Benz makes world-class cars in their factory down in, 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 in PE. Uh, Toyota, um, Ford, uh, BMW, they have a world-class mindset. They make world-class products. That we must own as South Africans. And um, I think Gail is quite right. There's a lot happening in the energy space. Um, unless our, our government does us a huge disfavor and, 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 and um, derails a lot of the good effort and energy that's happening in the back end, we will see the, the, the efforts of, of, of this non-renewable space yielding some new returns. We're probably going to have to wait 6, 12, 18 months for a lot of that to come through. Um, but industry is stepping up and doing what they do best. And, and it's, a, um, it's, it's, a, it's a very vibrant space. So I, I'm, I'm, you know, I, I think we need to see ourselves as part of a bigger picture, uh, not be too inwardly focused. Um, just imagine you're living uh, in the Ukraine or a country bordering Ukraine, what kind of existential questions you're asking yourself, right? So, you know, everybody has their issues. Um, and um, uh, we've got to deal with us and believe that we're capable of doing it. And uh, I believe we can. Thank you, Thomas. Thanks for that inspiration. And yes, I believe as, as SACIC and as all our members, um, all our manufacturing members with CIPSO, with Edgar Banks, with everybody involved, you know, the, there's that saying, dare to dream, dream big. And if you don't dream and you don't believe in your dream, well, you've already lost. Um, and, and, and that's the same sentiment that, that Thomas has just said. So. You know, I, I see a lot of successful companies, as I said earlier, I think this year we broke all records with exporting. Um, we've, we've topped the 178 billion. Um, and, and that's because people are doing the right things at the right time. So there, there is hope. And to all our listeners, we, I want to thank you. I want to thank you for listening. Um, we've had an hour and a half, basically, at, at short to discuss such a good topic. But if you listen to the experts that we've had on our panel today, um, everybody's got a positive thought and, and, and people are seeing success. I think success grows success and we need to build up on the growth of the success and, and we need to take the future into our own hands. I think that is, that is a question and not rely on a DTIC or a government fund or any other fund. You need to create it. You need to form partnerships. You need to form your own partnerships. You need to believe in what you're doing and you need to be an expert in what you're doing. And, and, and just to go back to what Thomas and uh, Philippa said earlier, you know, when, when you start in these markets, nothing happens overnight. You're not going to start something overnight and be successful overnight. This all takes time. And you have got time and you have got it. So on that note, I want to thank uh, uh, Prima Media and I want to hand over, thanks to all the sponsors as well, and hand over to Sharon to close off today. Shannon, thank you very much. Thanks to all the listeners. Thanks to the panel. Shannon, all yours. Thanks very much, Eric. Um, wow, what an inspirational last little few minutes. I really enjoyed that. Thank you, everyone, for that. I needed that. Um, and on that note, that brings us to the end of our webinar. I'd like to say thank you to our facilitator, Eric Brucherman, for enabling a robust and engaging discussion. Thank you also to our panelists, Gaylor Montmas and Claire from Trade and Industrial Policy Strategies, Tafadzwa Chibanguza from the Steel and Engineering Industries Federation of Southern Africa, Philippa Rodset from the Manufacturing Circle, Amit Singh from Nedbank, and Thomas Holtz from Multitech. Thank you also to our sponsors, Nedbank, Actum, AZ Armaturin, KEW Foundries, Richards Bay Industrial Development Zone, and SARE Synergy for their support in making this webinar possible. And finally, thank you to the attendees for taking the time to join us for this discussion on local manufacturing with a focus on rebuilding South Africa's industrial base and exports. Our next webinar takes place on the 21st of June at 2 p.m. and will focus on renewable energy. 
The link to register for that event has been shared in the chat. The recording of today's webinar will be sent to you in due course. And if you have any additional questions, please be in touch. You can reach us at shannon at creamamedia.co.za. Thank you so much for your time and goodbye.